The circle of exchange is essentially adults <coughs> with control and an expectation of almost power because sometimes the children don't necessarily want to be there, they have to be there, or they have to engage. So it's different to the, to the, circle, um, the circle participation. The thing is with this, if you imagine a child who's got a chaotic circle of intimacy, the circle of friendship doesn't exist, the circle of participation doesn't exist, the children take their, take their behaviour from the circle of intimacy and they drop straight into the circle of exchange. And you cop for it. And you cop for it because they've missed out that. And that's something that we call received behaviour. And you have to deal with that received behaviour. Now the challenge for us is, what do we do about children who've got developmental gaps? Because I'm talking about here, children who've been exposed to serious developmental gaps. It's not their fault. Okay? So, if a child comes into your school at eight or nine years old, and they can't read, what do you do? What do you do as a school if they can't read? I hope you teach them to read. Yeah? You teach them to read. And the reason they can't read is because they've got some developmental problems or they, 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 might, be, they might have missed on, out on some schooling. Or there's, a, there's a raft of reasons, but the fact is they can't read, so you teach them how to read. If they come into your school and they can't behave, what do you do? Tell them off, give them a sanction, kick them out. Or, possibly, teach them how to behave. What's the difference? What's the difference developmentally for a child <coughs> who's been through this, who drops into a school, who can't behave, to a child who comes in and can't read? As far as responsibility goes, there's only one difference. You're judged on how well they are, how, how good they are at reading, and that there's a league table for it, but you're not about behaviour. And actually, if they've got challenging behaviour, they might actually prevent you from going up the other league table. So where do you prioritise behaviour or reading? And that's the challenge. Or do you just lead to a sanction because you've got a really lovely neat system that allows you to, to um, put sanctions into sanction children with challenging behaviour when, the, when they've got a drug, drug addict father who beats the living daylights out of mum every single day in the home, he's exposed to drugs, violence and swearing and what you're doing is punishing him for his lifestyle. Just a little video clip about the influence of adults on children. <coughs> Looks like rain again today. Dark clouds gather and fill the sky. Don't know how to talk to you, just know how to say see children do. Um, should we punish those children for being brought up in that environment? Or should we, try, should we try and change them and change the environment and give them something to, a little bit to hope for and something to work with so that they don't just, that just doesn't get followed through and through and through and through and through? Because if we keep on punish those, punishing those children for the way they've been brought up, then they'll just do the same to their children and we'll just keep on punishing their children. And somebody has to deal with that eventually. Somebody has to work with it. I've got another little clip for you. And this clip just shows you the importance of child development on behaviour. And when I, you know, I said to you about the bit between 0 and 5 years old, well, just watch this clip and see what you think. <coughs> Not working, is it? Babies as <coughs> young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying you know, 34 years ago, when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. Wow. And it's still phase experiment, but the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her, 
This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on. Why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on, that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happened, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good. There's no reparation, and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. I think after, for me, the food for thought there is around the concept of the good, the bad, and the ugly. I think it's a really powerful clip. And this, this thing about the good, the bad, and the ugly, for me, links in really nicely with sanctions, because what's the difference between the bad and the ugly? The bad is, is, is a chance to put things right. The ugly is not. And so that baby didn't experience the ugly. But some of our children experience the ugly all the time. Because what they're doing is they're never given a chance to put it right, or they're actually not helped to put it right. And that is, a, that is a, an infant. And just look at the influence of the circle of intimacy on child development. When you've got a baby like that responding to the mother in that way. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Really powerful, particularly when linked to the concepts of sanctioning, challenging behaviour. And then they all link with child development and, and the background of those children. Okay, so what do we do about behaviour management? So when you're in your schools, you've got something to do, you've got to do behaviour management. But well, I think you've got two choices. The first one is you've got a linear choice. I've just made this up, but basically what it is is just a ladder. And you just work, you work your way up the ladder. It's like sanctions. You know, we've all been in schools where there's a list of sanctions and you move from one to another and this is what if this happens and you work your way up. And what happens when you get to the top of the ladder? You fall off. And you fall off and that's you done. Sanctions, of, uh, the list of sanctions have gone. The child's got to the top of the ladder, so that child now becomes somebody else's problem. Usually mine, but somebody else's problem. The other thing that you could do, is you could do what I call an inquiry approach to behaviour management. And the inquiry approach means get everything you know about that child, bring it all together, talk about it, look at that, look at it, think about it, and see whether you can actually change some behaviour and make that child happier and better in school. And that's, for me, is almost like a moral choice. And it's about your values. But it also it's about fitting into the systems. And no, people sit there and think, well, we can't do that in my school because, because the systems don't allow it. But the thing is, though, oh, the way I see it is this. It's those two things. You've got on that side, you've got sanction. On that side, you've got solution. And it's up to us, collectively, in our institutions, to challenge this concept of linear sanction-led behaviour management. Now, don't get me wrong, because I know I'm really batting at this side. I'm not some sort of liberal head teacher who lets kids get away with stuff. Absolutely not. I will challenge every single bit of, of challenging behaviour, and I will do something about it. But what I don't do is necessarily issue a sanction, thinking a sanction might work. I have a lot of consequences, 
and there is a consequence to pretty much every bit of challenging behaviour that happens in my school and believe me there's some bloody challenging behaviour on a day to day basis but it gets consequences and it gets challenged it's just not battered with sanctions this is something I call, I, I, another thing I've just invented called a bit of vision seesaw and it's, and it's about, this is really about you, it can, be, it can be school leaders but it can also be classroom practitioners and about your values and it's that problem that we have when you put values on one side of the seesaw and systems on the other and I know that I could probably log on to every single website for the schools that you've got in, in, in here now and you'll, they'll all tell me that the most, they are the most inclusive school where every child is valued where we do with brilliantly special needs children, we love everybody, and everybody can prosper at our school until they tell me to fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're out. <laughs> but the reason they tell you to fuck off is because the mum does, and so does the dad. Okay, and that to them is just a normal set of language. Because in their circle of intimacy, they've just, they've just lived with that for seven or eight years before they even went into school. And then you're punishing the fact that that's their child, that's child development, okay? And actually what happens in schools a lot, you get with the seesaw, is that systems tend to outbalance values. Now, I, can, I would proudly say in my school, I think that the values in my school will always outweigh the systems. Because what I'll do is I'll change the bloody systems to make sure I'm true to my values. And I'll sit down with my leadership team and I'll say, right, what are we going to do about this child? Because let's change something and let's change a system to make sure we can do something with this child to make sure we're not just kicking them out. And so I, I, I'm confident and happy that my seesaw is in the right balance. I'm, I'm not so sure it is everywhere else. And I, I, but I do understand. This is not me being critical of every, every, every other school. I'm just, I'm just trying to think about the, the question I posed at the start about do sanctions work? This is, this is my mantra at my school. We live and breathe unconditional positive regard and we absolutely mean it. And again, that doesn't mean we're sort of some sort of liberal mumbo jumbo. What it means is we absolutely bombard the children with niceness. Because what, you know what we're doing? We're replacing the circle of intimacy in school. And we're, we're taking children right back to being from that, those ages of 0 to 5 and we're, 